How you doing, everybody? I'm Simple Son. Um, we're going to check out a little bit of uh, uh, Lex Friedman, uh, Destiny, and Ben Shapiro debate. Um, I kind of have an opinion about these two. Um, but I'm going to let you guys listen to it a little bit. I'm going to jump in here and there. And uh, let's get into it. Let's see what they got to say. Bunch of assholes. You're conservative destiny you're a liberal can you each describe what so they say key values underpin your philosophy on politics and maybe life in the context of this left right political spectrum you want to go first yeah so i think that we have a huge country full of a lot of people a lot of individual talents capabilities um, and i think that the goal of government broadly speaking should be to try to ensure that everybody's able to achieve as much as possible so on a liberal level, that usually means some people might need a little bit of a boost when it comes to things like education. Um, they might need a little bit of a boost when it comes to providing certain necessities like housing or food or clothing. But broadly speaking, I mean, I'm still a liberal, not a communist or a socialist. I don't believe in the you know total command economy, total communist takeover of all of the uh, you know economy. But I think that broadly speaking, the government should kind of like kick in and help people when they need it. And that government can and should be big. Not necessarily. Uh, I notice that when liberals talk about government, or especially taxes, it seems like they talk about it for taxes sake or big, bigness sake. So people talk about taxes sometimes as like a, like a punishment, like tax the rich. Uh, I think taxing the rich is fine insofar as it funds the programs that we want to fund. But Democrats have a really big problem demonizing success or wealth. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing to be wealthy, to, to be a billionaire or whatever, as long as we're funding what we need to fund. Well, see, there's a problem with that, right? Like the tax to rich thing. The more you tax, the more you spend. The more you spend, the more you need to tax. So eventually you're going to run out of uh, rich people to tax or they're just going to hit a limit of like, hey, you know, um, we can't tax these people no more because, well, no, there's no growth in business. So we have to tax the middle class. And, and, and once you're done taxing those people to death, you're going to have to tax the lower, the, the lower class people. Then you're going to have to find little intricate ways like gas taxes and, and more income tax and more sales tax. Um, and, and you notice how he says about individualists. It, 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 yeah, it's great to have individualism, but what's the overstroking you know, arc of the government, right? He always talks about the, the intermediate you know, uh, cure for pain, but what's the overarching cure for the pain? So let's hear what Ben has to say. Ben, what do you think it means to be a conservative? What's, what's the philosophy that underlies your political view? So first of all, I'm glad that Destiny, you're already coming out as a Republican. That's exciting. Um, I mean, I, I, we hold a lot in common in terms of, uh, you know, the, the basic idea. Yeah, they do. I, I, they, they have a lot in common, more than they know. The, uh, that people ought to have as much opportunity as possible. And also, insofar as the government should do the minimum amount necessary to interfere in people's lives in order to pursue certain functions, particularly at the local level. So a lot of governmental discussions on a pragmatic level end up being discussions about where government ought to be involved, but also at what level government ought to be involved. And I have an incredibly subsidiary view of government. I, I think that you know local governments, because you have higher levels of homogeneity and, and consent, uh, are capable of doing more things. And as you abstract up the chain, it becomes more and more impractical and more and more divisive to, to do more things. In, in my view, government is basically there to preserve certain key liberties. Uh, the, those key liberties pre-exist the government uh, in, in so far as they are more important than what priorities the government has. The, the job of government is to maintain, for example, national defense, protection of property rights, uh, protection of religious freedom, Right. The, the, these are these are the key focuses of government as generally expressed in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And, and I agree with the general philosophy of the Bill of Rights and the, the Constitution. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't do more on a governmental level, again, as you get closer to the ground, which, by the way, is also embedded in the Constitution. People forget the Constitution was originally applied to the federal government, not to local and state governments. Um, but you know, if I were going to define conservatism, it would actually be a little broader than that, because I think to understand how people interact with government, you have to go to kind of core values. And, and so for me, there, there are a couple of premises. One, human beings have a nature. That nature... I'm going to stop right there. i got to say, Ben Shapiro is like a, a habitual like platitude machine. And he speaks a lot 
you know, speaks very fast to kind of make you seem like he's, he's, he's super intelligent. But it, it really, at the end of the day, it's just platitudes. You think about it, your liberties don't exist. They don't belong in this, the, the physical realm of space, right? You can't hold it. What's it made out of? It's an idea. So this this idea of liberties, even before the government was born, it, 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 that's just not true, right? Liberties and rights and laws are only as strong as the people willing to enforce them, right? Because they're, they're, you can't touch a right. You can't touch a liberty, right? What we feel is unalienable and alienable it's just not true. So, I mean, his whole platitudes of like, you know, these these liberties, you know, hold truth. No, no, it's 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 all about the people. So, you know, I just had to stop it and say, like, well, he just brings up, you know, very just I I, he's a platitude machine. There is neither good nor bad. We have aspects of goodness and we have aspects of badness. Human beings are sinful. We have temptations. And what that means is that we have to be careful not to incentivize the bad and that we should incentivize the good human being. So basically saying the bad is bad. Don't let it be good. Um, the good is good. So let's be good. Right. Again, more platitudes. Things do have agency and are capable of making decisions in the vast majority of circumstances. Um, and it is better for society if we act as though they do. Uh, second, the basic idea of human nature, there is an idea in my view, that all human beings have... Uh, he's going to say something about equality, I bet. ...equal value before the law. Told you. Which ain't true. Not everybody's equal in, in the eyes of the law. Um, that's why women get less prison sentences than men. Yeah, I'm, I'm a religious person, so I'd say equal value before God, but I think that's also sort of a key tenet of Western civilization, being non-religious or religious, that every individual has equivalent value. Remember, he, even though... Here's here's the thing about Ben Shapiro, right? He's a secularist when it comes to the United States of America, um, basically saying you know Christians shouldn't run, you know, freedom of religion, right? But ask him about Israel, see if he sees feels the same way about Israel. He's not. I got to be honest with you. He almost seems like a more Israeli citizen than he does an American citizen at times, right? Because. Uh, if you asked him about our southern border and say if you hypothetically asked him should we shoot people at the border, he would go, oh, no, absolutely not. We should never go that far. Well, ask him about the, the Israeli border, people invading the Israeli border. Should we shoot them? I bet he would say yes. He would have a different level of you know continuity for Israel as he would the United States. He, he almost – he has a – a, a connection that's higher than that. His religion. That's Ben Shapiro for you. He's a liberal in disguise. In sort of cosmic terms. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that every person is equally equipped to do everything equally well. And so it is not the job of government to rectify every imbalance of life. The quest for cosmic justice, as, as Thomas Sowell suggests, uh, is something that government is generally incapable of doing and more often than not botches and makes things worse. So th those are a few key tenets, and that, that tends to materialize in, in a variety of ways. The, the, the easiest way to sum that up would be the, the traditional kind of three legs of the, the conservative stool, although now obviously there's a very fragmented conservative movement in the United States. He says, you, you notice how he says, uh, the, you know, there's a limited range of what government should and can do. I bet you if our government was giving hundreds of billions of dollars to a certain country that he felt, you know, high about, that he really enjoyed, I bet you he would. He enjoys that government spending, doesn't he? He en he enjoys that government intervention. Would be a uh, a socially conservative view in which family is the chief institution of society, like the little platoons of society, as, as Edmund Burke suggested, uh, in which free free markets and property rights are extraordinarily valuable and necessary. Uh, because every individual has the ability to be creative with their property and to freely alienate that property. Uh, you, you hear him stuttering, right? I mean, I, I, I have a speech impediment. That's why I stutter sometimes. But you can hear him stutter as like, uh, uh, let me let me list off all these platitudes I've heard before and everybody else can hear. And it's like, you know, uh, you know, free speech, um, right to bear arms, um, property rights, and all these other things, right?
you know, we love free speech. He he likes the speech he likes. I uh, and and don't worry, I, I'm not kind on destiny either. Uh, and finally, I tend toward a hawkish foreign policy that suggests that the world is not filled with wonderful people who all agree with us and think like us. And those people will pursue adversarial interests if we if we do not protect our own interests. You mean you have your own underlying interests uh, outside of the borders of the United States? I don't know why. He, see, he's very, being very disingenuous, right? So almost by omission, he's lying. Can mm -hmm. I ask a question on that? I'm so yeah, curious. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I'm excited for this conversation because I consider you to be really intelligent. Um, but You lying asshole. But I feel like sometimes there are ways that conservatives talk about certain issues that seem to defy logic and reason, I guess. So here, and I'm sure you feel the same way about progress. Well, I feel the same way about progressives, um, but even some uh, liberals for sure. Uh, before I ask this question, it's going to relate to education. We can agree, broadly speaking, that statistics are real and that not everybody could do everything. So for a grounded example, uh, my life was pretty bad. I got into streaming and I turned my life around and that was really cool, but I can't expect everybody to do what I did, right? Like everybody being able to join the NBA or to be like a streamer. Well, of or, course, everybody yeah. has different qualities, sure. sure. Okay, so I used to be a lot more libertarian um, when I was 20, 21. And one of the things that dramatically changed kind of my view on government uh, manipulation of things in the I guess in society came uh, when it came time to deal with my son and the school that he went to. And one of the things that I noticed was when it came time to send my son to school, I could either do private education or I could do public. Uh, personally, I did 12 years of Catholic private education. Um, however, the public schools in Nebraska, depending on where you lived, were very, very, very good. And I opted for a certain district. I bought a house there. I moved there. And then my son was able to go to those schools. Um, and he's been going through those schools. And the difference of availability of like technology, like these kids are taking home iPads in like first grade. Uh, they've got like huge computer labs and everything. Do you think that there is some type of, I don't want to say injustice or unfairness, because I'm not even looking at it that way, just pragmatically, that there might be children that are in certain schools that if they just had better funding or more uh, access to technologies or things available to them, that those kids would become more productive members of society? No, the answer is no. I don't know what Ben Shapiro's answer is going to be, but the answer is no, because do you know what kids have the best outcomes? The ones homeschooled. The fact is, and they, they work off of whatever technology they have at home. You know, basic run-of-the-mill technology with uh, the, the syllabus being written basically by the school board and the parents implementing that. Now, could you say that that sociability of, of not going to a public school or a school with other kids may affect that child? Sure. But it, it doesn't change the fact that the outcomes are... are, are much greater in the positive for homeschooled children. So I don't know what Ben's answer is going to be, but the actual answer is no. Throwing money at the problem isn't going to solve it. I mean, where I'm at, the state I'm in, they threw enough money at the school system. There, in my area, there's not even, out of hundreds of schools, there's not even one kid in testing that was even proficient in math and English. They've thrown billions at this problem. Money is not the answer. It's culture. It's culture. It's the it's the home life. It's how you raise your children. It's it's the parenting, two parent household, heterosexual, heteronormal, uh, two parent household. That with like a little bit of a help, they they could actually achieve more and do better for all of society. So I think that on the list of priorities, when it comes to education, mm -hmm. the availability of technology is actually fairly low on the list of priorities. Sure, Meaning the two things the, I've heard are well, food availability and I think air conditioning, I think, are the two biggest ones that I hear, but sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing in terms of education itself, not just the physical facilities that we're talking about. Well, I'm going to tell you, food was lacking in the 1950s and air conditioning, but they seem to get around pretty damn good. Talking about mm -hmm. would actually be two-parent family households. Sure. Communities that, that have fathers in them is sure. actually the number one. Decisive are according to Roland Fryer and, and many studies done on the, this particular topic. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, that money alone, that investment of resources is the top priority in schooling is belied by the fact that LAUSD, which is where I went to school when I was younger, mm -hmm. uh, they pour an enormous amount of money into LAUSD. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars very often per student. Mm -hmm. And it does not result in better schooling outcomes. And so when you say if we could give every kid an iPad. Would you give every kid an iPad? The question is not, 
if I had a replicator machine from Star Trek, would I give everybody an enormous amount of stuff? Sure, I, I would. Mm -hmm. Every every resource is finite. Every resource is limited, and you have to prioritize what are the what are the outcomes that you seek in terms of the means with which you are seeking them. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think that the question is is I, I quibble with it with the premise of the question, which is that again the the chief injustice when it comes to education on the list of of injustices is lack of availability to technology or that it's a funding problem I, I just don't think that's the case sure i mean i agree with him on that right like he didn't go as far i mean it's basically just you know same thing i just said the money is not the issue it, it's it's culture it's two parent households um it, it's it's structure and i can half agree with you there but i don't think any amount of changes in the schools will create two parent households Right, we can't bring it. I, I, I totally to the, agree yeah. with you. So that's why I think that the, the fundamental educational problem is not, in fact, a schooling problem. I think that it pre-exists that. Sure, but then I feel like we're now. I feel like this is kind of the conservative merry-go-round where it's like, what can we do to help with schools? So two of the things that I've seen, I think that you can abolish uh, no fault divorces. Um, you know, have have Christian values. Stop being Christophobias. Phobics, Christophobics uh, against Christians. Um, let marriage run through, you know, the church. Uh, the secularists can have their own little thing too, but um, you know, people opt in for the church and have that community because we're pushing away the community for secularism, where there's a vast majority of our kids can't even name five countries around the world, including our own that are usually brought up in research is one is air conditioning that children in hotter environments just don't learn as well um and then the second one is access to so are you saying every kid in in like arab countries are dumb i mean is that what you're saying destiny are you are you basically being like geopolitical racist are you saying that like you know if you live in like uh, you know iraq there's no way that you could learn because uh it's hot outside <laughs> Such, such a dumb, dumb, that's a dumb reading. To food. So like kids that are given like a breakfast or a lunch that's provided at school, like increases educational outcomes. Now I agree that... Opposed to what? Our, our you know, mass diabetic problem, our obesity problem. I mean, I'm fat. It's because I had too much food, right? It's, it's, it's not so much the lack of food, it's the correct food. That neither of these things might be determinative in like, well, 20% of kids were graduating and now 80% of kids are graduating. Or these kids are all going, you know, from with their GEDs into the workforce and now these kids are all suddenly becoming engineers. But in terms of where we can help, do you think there should be like some minimum threshold or minimum baseline of like, at the very least, every school should have a non-leaky gym or every school should have, uh, if children can't afford lunch or breakfast, like some sort of food provided or every school should have these like baseline things. So again, I'm going to quibble with the premise of the question because sure. I think that when it comes to, for example, food insecurity, school food programs, mm -hmm. again, you can always pour money into any program and at the margins mm -hmm. create change. I mean, there's sure. no doubt that pouring money onto anything will create change in a marginal way. The question is how large is the margin and how big is the movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not going to solve the base problem of uh, the parents don't care or parent doesn't give a shit. Um, so the kid's not going to give a shit. Um, the teacher's not going to give a shit. The school board's not going to give a shit. And uh, throwing money at it changes nothing. It actually feels like it made it worse. Right, so the delta is what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that the you're, you're starting at a second-order question, which is what if we ignore what I would think are the big primary questions of education, namely family structure, value of education at home, how much you have parents who are capable or willing to help with homework? What are the incentive structures we can set up for a society that actually facilitate that? How local communities take ownership of their schools is a big one, mm -hmm. right? All, all of these issues we're ignoring in favor of, say, air conditioning or lunch programs. And so in a vacuum, if you say air conditioning and lunch programs, sounds great in a vacuum. In, in terms of prioritization of values and cost structure, are those the things that I think are going to move the needle in a major way in terms of public policy? I, I do not. And, I, and in fact, I think that many of them end up being disproportionate wastes of money. I mean, I, I've talked before pretty controversially about the fact that an enormous amount of school lunch programs are thrown out. Like an enormous amount of that food ends up in the garbage can. Because it's not a lack of food. It's the correct food. That's the problem. We have plenty of food. It's not. It, we're not lacking the resources to make food and sandwiches for kids, right? I mean, if, if the kid, I mean, if if it was about the food, um, then 
it should be more about the food at home, right? Because I mean, you're you're spending equal parts time at school as you are at home. Uh, so, were you saying the kids not doesn't have enough food at home, or is it just not enough food at at school? So, I mean, really, what's the problem? I mean, it's a, a blanket statement of just saying, oh, it's just the food. Well, ex- well, expand on that idea. You know what I mean? Instead of just saying blanketly, it's 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 the food. It's the fucking food. It ain't the food, Destiny. It, 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 two platitude monsters are 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 battling it out right now. Is there a better way to do that? If there is a better way to do it, then I'm perfectly willing to hear about that better way to do it. But it seems to me that one of the big flaws in in the way that many people of the left approach government is what if we hit every gnat with a hammer, and my question is, what if the gnat isn't even the problem? What if there is a much bigger substructure problem that needs to be solved in order to, if you're shifting deck chairs on the Titanic, sure, you can make the Titanic slightly more balanced because the deck chairs are slightly better oriented. But the real question is the, the water that's gaping into the Titanic, right? Yeah, and I agree with you 100%. But again, the, I feel like we're on the conservative merry-go-round. Well, no, you can't technically agree with him 100% because you're putting a butt on the other end and, and you're trying to rebut whole what he just said so you don't agree with him 100% because if you did you would go oh okay and end the conversation there so you, let's let's call a spade a spade bro men of never wanting to address as a conservative merry-go-round i can so, i can give you 10 ways well sure but so like here would be the merry-go-round i would say that like there is a minimum funding for schools that i think would help children and then we go well the thing that would help them the most is two parent households and i go okay well two parent households actually aren't the problem um the issue is access to things like birth controls so that people don't have children early on and it's like but the issue isn't actually birth control the issue is actually you need a certain amount of money to move out early and to get married and then to have a two parent household so it's actually like economic opportunity no well it's not you know no, just two parent households that's yeah, it. but like, what is the what are the precursors? Don't fuck people for, before you're married and have babies. Sure, done. That's great. We can say that and try to fight against you know however many hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution. But people will have sex and people will make babies. And then they used to get married. The vast majority of people in this country mm-hmm. with kids used to be married. The vast majority of people with kids in this country sure. now are not married. Increasingly, mm-hmm. that- I do agree. I do agree because I, it, it's it's starting to feel like well, I mean it's always been that way. Uh, women are married to the government, married to the welfare program. Um, you know, you feel incentivized, or at least, uh, you know, capable of leaving that partner you may or may not like, or um, the money is enticing, um, you know, especially with the culture of, like, independence, right? Independent from whom, right? Well, what if men said that, right? Well, women would be very, very lonely and abandoned, right? Just the same way men feel, right? It's, it's, that, that's the equality of it. You know, who are you independent from? That but is a lot obviously the, a societal change. Co- Something yeah, changed. It wasn't human evolution. But a lot of those things in terms of resting on whether or not people get married have to do with financial decisions. Do you have the money? People to, are worse off now than they were 50, 60 years ago when the marriage rates were higher? People are delaying the start of their careers because education is going to be increasingly important. So in, in other words, people are richer now and they have more education now, and yet they're having more babies out of wedlock now because they're richer and have more education? I'm saying that the... One of the biggest indicators for whether or not somebody's willing to get married is how much money both people are making if they can move out of their household. People don't tend to want to get married at 22 when they've just finished college, when they don't have the money to move out and they can't afford a house. Because we have, I agree with that partially, right? It, 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 the rent compared to the percentage of how much you spend on rent compared to how much you get paid is is way up from what it used to be, right? Even from when I was, you know, turning 18, right? Uh but is that the only reason? No, it, it, it's it's a cultural change. It's, there's a shift. There's been a shift. You know, uh, that you know these wave different waves of feminism, especially third wave, in second and third wave feminism is just just blown the backs out of all these women. Like, I mean, men feel disgusted and like, well, you're whoring yourself out there. Why wouldn't I treat you like a whore, right? And women are like, well, men are out there whoring people out. Let me be a whore, right? Like, you know, it, it's a cultural thing. Everything we watch, everything we listen to, same thing, right? You know, wet ass pussy. Change the moral status of marriage in the culture, meaning that everyone, poor, rich, and in between, used to get married. That is, by the way, a huge percentage of marriages in the United States used to be what they would call shotgun marriages, meaning that somebody knocked somebody up, and because they did not want the baby to be born outside of a two-parent household, they would then get married. Do we think that shotgun marriages, though, are a way to bring back equilibrium to education? Yes. That if we... Yes, absolutely. 
Yes, 100%. Do we a think child that, deserves a mother and a father. Sure. Because but, that is the basis for all of this, including education. Do we think that shotgun marriages are, well, let's say this. Do we think that that's a reasonable direction that society would ever take? Or is this like... Yes, it was the reasonable direction for nearly all of modern history. Was, but history moves in one direction. Right. Why? Because of time? I mean, people, people don't think that's... Uh, in, in, what, in what way is that... Is, well, I mean, if that's true, Destiny, if, if, if history only moves in one direction, um, at some point, even, uh, you know, your social programs existed, some social programs existed, then they didn't exist, and now you want them back again. So why are you trying to go back? You want to pick and choose. Destiny's a picking and chooser, right? Like, he's a, uh, he's a, he's a cart jumper, you know. He'll jump on different ideas and he, he'll he'll contradict himself and say he's not contradicting himself at any chance he gets. Is and I don't think we've ever I mean, like regressed yes, I, social standards back to like oh well let's go a hundred years back and do things that you know used to exist before. I that's think weird. the like, entire left right now is arguing that we regress social standards by rejecting Roe versus Wade. So that's <laughs> obviously not true. The Roe versus Wade is not a social standard; it's a Supreme Court ruling. Number yes, one. Number then, two. What if you read the actual majority opinion on Roe v. Wade? We can see that socially, we ever na actually never made huge progress on how society viewed abortion. This has always been an incredibly divisive thing, right? Even that was, I think, part of Alito's uh, writing on it was that things like gay marriage, for instance, we've kind of moved past, and it's not really as debated anymore. But abortion was never a settled topic, the, the despite notion, Roe v. Wade. The notion of the arc of history mm -hmm. constantly moves in one direction is belied by nearly all of the 20th century. What do we mean by that? I mean, I mean, in the terms first of like women's the rights, civil rights, barbarism, communism, Nazism, all of that was a regression from what was happening at, for example, the beginning of the 19th century and the 20th century. What, in what way? Nazism and communism weren't a regression from what was for, going on well, in 1905. These are, well, in terms of like communism being a regression, for instance, I'm not a communist, but like the industrialization of the Soviet Union happened under a communist society. The industrialization. So the murder of tens sure, of millions of people. Yeah, there's I consider that a regression. There, Sure. A moral regression, which is what we are talking about now, moral regression. And you're, you're, you're suggesting that moral regression, I wouldn't term mm -hmm. a return to traditional values a moral regression, you would. But your suggestion is that history only moves in one direction. And I'm suggesting that history does not only move in, in one direction, it tends to move actually back and forth. Sure. I don't think that all of history moves in one, uh, one direction. See, he just, he just jumped on a cart. Ben changed his position a little bit. You know, he shifted. So now, now he just said, I mean... You know, you can rewind over yourself. You heard Destiny just say, history only moves in one direction. Of course it does. And he argued he argued in the affirmative that it, it only goes in one direction. But yet here he is saying, oh, well, and it's not all history. All history doesn't move that way. Which, you know, it, it doesn't. But he said it did. So, again, you can't trust a goddamn thing this word comes out of his mouth. There are going to be wars. There are going to be times of peace. I think in general, we're more peaceful now than we have been in the past. But I think when we look at the way that people live their lives, I think that we tend to move in a certain direction. So yeah, but like Ben just said, a moral regression, right? Because there's been times where it was debauchery and then more prudence time. Uh, debauchery comes again, more prudence times. Good, bad, good, bad, right? Because, uh, I mean, if you ask Destiny the question, is society on a pendulum? It, it swings back and forth, right? You know, each pendulum swing has an equal and opposite force, right? So, I mean, I'm pretty sure Destiny would agree. So, his whole idea of history only moves in, you know, forward aggression is just, it, it's, it's, it's just false. Again, it's just a platitude he's trying to use to make himself sound smart. Socially, so when it comes to things like racism or when it comes to things like slavery or women's rights, I think that there are two huge things that probably aren't changing in the U.S. And one is access to contraception and one is women working jobs. I think that these two things are probably huge things that are moving us off of shotgun marriages or getting married very early on. And I don't see those. Do you think that those two things are going to change fundamentally? First of all, what the data tend to show is that actually more highly educated people, as you were saying, tend mm -hmm. to get married more. So the idea is that women getting an education somehow throws them off marriage. It's the opposite. Yeah, but, but Ben, I don't. I disagree with you there too. I mean, even your 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 parse data says that hey, educated women get married more it, it, by percentage, maybe, but the amount actually goes down if you think about the marriage stays shorter. I mean, they get divorced at a higher rate. Um, they initiate the divorce at over 90% of the time. And the the, the, the only people that they want to date, that it, because women date in hypergamy, they want to go up. So the amount of overall marriages are going down, even for educated people, 
there's less marriages happening now per capita than ever before. Even though they're, you know, in this this small little subsection of uh, people, some educated women are getting married more, but that's very few and far between. Usually, but those women, women are not getting, educated. But, but those women are getting shotgun marriages. Those women aren't having children. Yeah, but now, now, now you're shifting the topic. My my topic was how to get more people married, and what I'm suggest and, and then you suggested that higher levels of education are delaying marriage and making it less probable. And what I'm telling you, because this is what the data suggests, is that actually as you raise up the the educational ladder, people tend to be married more than they are lower down on the educational ladder. It yeah, that's because they're smart enough to realize, you know, two people putting two heads together gets the problem solved faster. Not twice as fast, usually like four times as fast. So, but also at the same time, there's it seems to be a higher divorce rate between more, is at least more educated women, higher divorce rate. If you're a high school graduate, you're less likely to be married than if you're a postdoc. I agree with you, but that's because one of the biggest precursors to getting married is having like a level of economic stability. So as people get more educated, they obtain this economic stability, and then they're in a more comfortable position to explore more serious relationships. There's another. No, it's because educated people aren't aren't swayed by the culture as much as dumb people. Dumb people are out there twerking in the clubs, uh, doing drugs and drinking and, and having unprotected sex, and and uh, they don't care about structure, aka religion, right? A okay, confound there. I mean, the confound is that mm -hmm. people in stable marriages tend to be the children of stable marriages, and there's only one way to break that cycle, which is to create a stable marriage, and that is something that is in everyone's hands. Again, this notion that it is somehow an un breakable, unshatterable barrier to get married and have kids. I don't understand where this is coming from. Why is that such a why is that such a challenge? It's I don't think it's unbreakable or unshatterable. I was just the initial point was for school, if we can provide a minimum level of educational stuff for children, that'd probably be good. But when we retreat back to, well, it has to be the families that are fixed first, fixing families is a multivariate so problem. My, my, listen, so many I am yeah. fine within my See Destiny doesn't want to get into the family argument because of his own personal uh, uh, nonsense, right? You know, uh, his open relationship, uh, the failure in that, because uh, he is not the person to talk about relationships with, right? I mean, there's lots of people who have failed relationships, but when your relationship, uh, you know, swayed on the, the chance that your partner may or may not sleep with another person and uh, fall for that person, you're leaving open that option. So, the idea of having a marriage and culture of, you know, some kind of structure for destiny is out of the question. So basically he goes back to platitudes of like, hey, let's just shove money down the throats of educational programs. And, um, you know, let's not talk about the actual issue. Let's just throw money at it, right? So, you know, throwing money at a problem never fixes it. Almost never. Really, it just never does. And, um... You know, we'll continue with these two platitude machines. And um, if you enjoyed, hit the like, subscribe button. Um, I'm going to do another video on the next topic, what they're about to get into. And uh, see you in the next one. Peace.